you have your Bibles, which I hope you do, please turn to the book of Acts, chapter 4, and I'll be also speaking out of chapter 3. Today I want to, I want to remove the veil. And expose the enemy this morning, and I'll be continuing this series over the next several weeks. Exposing the enemy through understanding persecution. I think a lot of people today mix persecution up with suffering. You'll hear people who are going through trials and tribulations and I'm suffering for the gospel. That's really not persecution and it's not for the gospel. As we see in the book of Acts, we understand persecution, we understand martyrdom, we see it throughout those that are in scripture. Chapter 3, we see John getting out there and Peter getting out there right after the great day of Pentecost. But I want us to remember truly understanding that persecution and suffering are very different. And we need to understand that because we we don't want to confuse the two. Because sometimes suffering comes because the Lord allows his children to suffer, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Sometimes we bring it upon ourselves. Can I say this? More often than not, we bring suffering upon ourselves, and it's because of sin. You you know, it's amazing. I I I want us to recognize something for a minute. And I find this kind of like parallel to what we're seeing. Do you you know most people know what they need to do to stay healthy? But they don't do it. They don't. You know, I'm I'm on a diet right now. And I don't even want to call it a diet, a lifestyle. And lately I've um, had a few popcorns and a few um, nuts that's cheating? Yes, for me it is. But, but what's amazing to me about this particular lifestyle, it was developed by a, a heart surgeon out of Cleveland Clinic. He couldn't understand why the patients who were taking all the statins and you know, living you know, a, a vegan life or a healthy life, lean meats, this and that, he was seeing them you get bypass surgery seven years later. He says, there's got to be a reason. There's got to be something that's going on here. And I, I want you to... To, to, to bear with me for a moment. So he started to do his research, and he found out it, it, by going to central China, hooking up with another doctor, they did research for a number of years, and they recognized that in these places in central China or in certain places in Africa, there, were, there was nowhere that a heart surgeon would be able to make a living. And they wanted to know why. And it really came down to food. That's really what it came down to. And I'm not going to bore you with all the details. I would love to share it with you. Speak to me after service because it's done wonders for me. But here's the crazy thing. He had test subjects come in. So, you know, they do the, the, the trials. They test everything. And every one of the subjects that were brought to him were were basically told to go home, find a rocking chair. You'll be gone in a year. I mean, he had guys that barely could walk down a corridor to go from one side of the building to the other in the hospital to come to his office, you know, out of breath, legs swollen, all these kind of crazy things. And he says, listen, this is what we're going to do. And he had everybody sign up. They did all their vitals. They took all the blood work. Bottom line was this. If you follow this lifestyle... He says, we're going, to cl- we're going to clean up cardiac disease in your life. And within weeks, the same guy that barely could walk across was walking on his own strength, his own might, his own power. And 20 years later, which is about now, or 22 years later, all of these people, 
are all still alive, living vibrant lives, everybody but one. And that person took his own life. And it was because of, um, I don't have to get into the details, but I wanted to, just in case you checked up on me. Um, but this one person was the only one who died and was not of natural causes. But here's the thing that really gripped me. On top of everyone not having cardiac disease, which guys had bypasses, heart attacks, and this is women too. I mean, bot, the whole body was just corroded and blocked. Every one of them are alive today, living vibrant lives, but this is the thing that caught me. They have absolutely no disease. No cancer, no diabetes, no other diseases in their bodies. So why aren't they screaming from the rooftops to say to everybody in America, let's get off of this diet that we're living and we're eating now because the food pyramid should be changed and saying, hey, listen, you can live a healthy life. And that doesn't mean you need to stop eating fish and chicken and beef. I, I want to be very clear. I stopped that to reverse it because I've already done a tremendous amount of damage. But there is a way to live a balanced life that we can live from what I can see just in this disease-free life. See, sometimes suffering is brought on because we just don't want to change. And I'm not just talking physically. I'm also talking mentally. And I'm going to drive the point home over the next several weeks, especially spiritually. Oh, woe is me. I'm being persecuted again and I'm being attacked again. Well, maybe it's because we're not changing the ungodly nature that is in us. See, the early church was persecuted for standing firm in their faith. Romans chapter 5 says this, verse 1, And therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Man, that's salvation. We have been justified through the blood of Jesus Christ. We have been cleansed and we have been made whole. Through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. That's my hope. That's my rejoice. I want to live in his glory. I want to visually see his glory when he takes me from this earth to the next. Because this is the meaning of life. It's not about what you have. It's not about how many toys. It's not about your happiness. It's not about my happiness. We take joy in the fact that we have been chosen by God to be a born-again believer, believing that he had died on the cross for the remission of my sins. I stay in faith in that. That's what I hold on to, and that gives me the true joy. But the enemy's always trying to rob that. Not rob me of my joy. Rob me of the fact and try to drag me back into sin. So guess what? I forfeit that. <coughs> and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our suffering. Because we know, listen to this, we know that the suffering produces perseverance. Can I have a light above me? It's one of those little slidey things. You're going to get a, gla a glare. That's perfect. You're going to get a glare off of my rooftop. Forgive me. <laughs> but I need to see the scripture. <coughs> Not only so, but we also rejoice in our suffering because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. 
Let's stop there for a minute. Know that the suffering, what kind of suffering? What kind of suffering? Whatever it may be that comes in your life, whether it's through the faith that we stand firm on and the suffering that comes with it, or maybe through a, a, a trial that has come upon us like Job. But Job stood firm in the faith. God is sovereign. God is holy. Instead of being like, you know, Lord, come on now. When's enough enough? I don't know if you've ever said that, if you were bold enough to say that. I was stupid enough to say that. See, we have to understand <clears throat> we can't allow sin in our lives that brings suffering to take the place of true persecution. For us, the church of today doesn't suffer like it did back in the days of the apostles in the book of Acts. Well, why is that if we are the real church? You reading my notes back there, Judy? Did you, are you reading my notes? Let me just say this. And I'll just repeat my sister because she's prophetic. <laughs> they do in other countries. And they do also in our country. Maybe not to the degree, but I want us to understand if we're going to be the real church, we have to remove the veil that Satan has put in front of us, who's deceived us to say the suffering that we may be going through and, and the trials and the tribulation, well, that's persecution. It's not. There's a difference. See, in the early church, <coughs> persecution came, and it came at a high cost. We see in the first 11 years, historically, the church five times was systematically persecuted. And we see some 2,000 years later that the church is still be persecuted, but differently and mostly in other countries. We see in the early churches, we see that the persecution began with Stephen. It extended nearly to all the apostles. Death became the common way to go if you were a Christian. Definitely was the way to go. We see one of the first persecution, it broke out under Nero. We talked about this, the emperor of Rome. It wasn't too long after the church began. Nero contrived all kinds of punishments for the Christians. Listen to this. He would sew up people, and I know I've shared this with you before, but hopefully we can just hear me again to drive this point home. Christians were sewed up in the skins of wild animals and they were turned to hungry dogs and the dogs consumed the animals in them. They were used, they were dressed in wax shirts and attached to trees to be lit on as torches in the garden. We've seen more extensive persecutions to Christians who were imprisoned, and then they were put on racks. They were seared. They were broiled. They were burned. They were scorned. They were stoned. They were hanged. They were crucified. Many were lacerated with irons, and others were thrown onto the horns of wild bulls. Some Christians in the fourth persecution were, were already with wounded feet made to walk on thorns, nails, sharp uh, shells. Some were uh, scourge until their flesh was gone. Others were beheaded, and so on it went. 
That was only the beginning of what the church has undergone under Satan's persecution. Can you see it? Remember what the scripture says. We fight not against flesh and blood. But we fight against demonic principalities. We see that, right? So we shouldn't be fighting against one another, but man, Satan's done a good job, right? That's how he comes in and divides. That's how he breaks apart. It blows my mind under some of the things that we allow Satan to break us from his church. And he does it in such clever ways. And I want to talk about that a little bit today. We see persecution come to the church and we see it as Satan's persecution. And over time, he has progressed and he's become more subtle. And I think we can see his techniques are working today, and they're quite successful. In the beginning, it was a steady stream of persecution that has gone on since the commencement of the church. In one way or another, the Christian church is always under persecution, and it's not always political. It is sometimes personal. It is sometimes religious. It is sometimes from illegitimate Christianity. And I've seen it firsthand. Literally, I've been in in a Catholic church, and I've been able to share at, at funerals and different things, but I was told, not just me, anybody else, if you were not a Catholic, you cannot break bread with us. <clears throat> and it's not just only that. It's also in the charismatic churches. Because many of the charismatic churches today have taken a liberal stance and have taken a political stance. And what do I mean by that? Listen, can I tell you something? My stance is in the Holy Scripture. And we've shared on this. I'm not going to talk more about this. But we see the greatest persecution come through the, invent, uh, through the um, illegitimate Christianity. And this liberal Christianity, at least in the American church. But I want you to see how we see Satan work so, so subtly today in his persecution. It's not what it used to be. Satan usually directs the persecution today, not to the physical body, but you know what he attacks? The mind and most of all the ego of men and women today. He directs his persecution at pride, at acceptance, at status. And he's very effective at it. He doesn't threaten the Christian by saying, if you witness, I will cut off your head. No, he threatens the Christian by saying, if you witness, you will be persecuted at your church. People will make fun of you. If you witness at your job, you will lose your job. If you take a stance for holiness and righteousness, people will come and attack you, throw eggs at your house. You will become a target. And many people, guess what? Zip it up. See, Satan plants us in in our minds that we can't do these things. But this is exactly what we are supposed to do. That was a lame one there. Let me try this again. This is exactly what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be standing up for holiness and for righteousness. We're supposed to be standing up for Christ. 
The question is, do you avoid a conversation when somebody comes up with something which you know is contrary to the Word of God? Or do you take a stand? Can I tell you something? You know, one thing I didn't write in my notes, and I'm going to write it down now. It's there. It's there. He also works through fear. Because we're afraid to say something. And you know what his next words are? It's because you're not smart enough. <laughs> you don't know the scriptures well enough. Can I tell you something? In a moment, we're going to see as the religious leaders, the Sadducees came at John and Peter. You know what they said? Man, these guys are uneducated. They haven't been trained up in the right way. Where does this all come from? <laughs> Right here. This is where the Holy Spirit lives. In that very hour, I will give you the words to speak. In that very moment, I'll bring back to your remembrance. But he can't bring back anything to remember if you haven't read it at least once. Back in that day... The form of persecution in the early church made heroes out of those who died. And the church what? Grew. After Stephen, and we'll talk about him later on, not today, but at a different time. After Stephen lost his life, it says the church came under great persecution and then it scattered. And what was that? Evangelism. See, we can't mix up suffering with persecution. Persecution comes at the cost of the gospel and standing firm in the faith. Suffering sometimes comes, but it produces something in us. Character. Perseverance. It became a normal thing in the, for a Christian to die, but today the persecution that comes is more effective. It doesn't make heroes out of anybody. And it's a sad thing. While the church today is not being physically curled, uh, killed, the church today has succumbed to every kind of living spiritual death. Are we dying spiritually, guys? Or are we standing for the faith? I think in Revelation chapter 3, let's turn there together, the church of Sardis. Keep your finger on Acts 4. We see here the church of Sardis. And he writes to this church, These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up. Strengthen what remains, and it is about to die, for I have not found your deeds complete in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Obey it. Repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I will come to you. Yet you have few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out. Remember that. I will never blot out his name from the book of life, but will acknowledge his name before my Father and his angel. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to what? The churches. The book of Revelation was written for his people, his churches. We have to wake up. See, Satan has, has caused us to slumber. I'm going to ask you something, and let's be real about this. I, I want to I be real with you for a moment because this has been on my heart for quite a while. How many of us, and I'm going to use the word us instead of saying you, 
because it's us. We are a family. How many of us have truly invited someone out to church? Don't raise your hands. But have you sought to bring people in the church? I'm going to laugh. Can, 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 I just, can I joke about something? And, and, and I'm, I'm, only, I'm only bringing this one person up because I know them intimately. And it's, it's Nellie. She just made a face at me. I don't know if I'm going to, I don't know, I don't know if I'm going to be eaten next week. I'm telling you right now. I can't even begin to tell you how many people she invites to church. If you're going to get your teeth worked on in her chair, you're going to get an invitation. Well, how do I know? Because she's constantly asking me for business cards. Now, you all might be doing that, but not one other of you have ever asked me for business cards, so let's just keep it that way. But you might be grabbing them off of the back table. But I want us to understand something. In the early church, man, thousands upon thousands were being saved, even after they saw the great persecution, even they, after they saw Ananias and Sapphira be killed because they understood the gift of salvation. They understood life was about sharing that good news, even to the point of death. That's persecution. Is Nellie afraid to lose a job? No, because she knows the answer. And so the question is, how fervent are we about inviting people out? Sharing the good news, having things ready for an invitation. You see those foldouts that we have in, back, in the back. If you read through them, if any of you have truly read, because a lot of time had been taken, but it brings the salvation message there because we want people to be saved from this wretched world. And see, Satan has just lied to us, and we need to take that veil off. We cannot allow him to keep our voices shut. Man, when that mask went on, Now it's what it was, a symbol for a lot of us trying to keep our voices shut. You know, the wisdom of the elders many years ago when they brought us online, I didn't want to go online. I'll never forget that. Pastor, we want to get your message online. It needs to be heard. I said, no. No, 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 no. Little did I know through them God was working for the day that the church doors would have to be closed for a season. And we can still get the message out there. Big opening statement I got going here, huh? So we see that he knew very few people in their hearts, he was talking to the church at Sardis, were really going out there and living for Christ, wanting to get the gospel message out there. See, I, I want to drive something home. It's not about how pretty the church looks. It's not about the lawn. It's not about the gardens. It's not about the air fresheners. <laughs> and we have sweet air fresheners. But I've also seen people leave the church because of our air fresheners. I'm not lying to you guys. People leave the church. The music's too loud. It's not this. It's not right. The temperature. My gosh. People are so concerned about the temperature. Right, nothing for nothing. I'm dying in here right now. But you know what? I'm not leaving. I don't think I can leave right now. <laughs> The church of Sardis was told, we need to wake up. We need to remove the veil of the enemy because you see how subtle he is? And he works and plucks at the cords of our heart. You know, you, you love Jesus. I know you do. This is how the enemy works, just like he did with Eve. You know, you're timid. You're very quiet and loving. You don't need to share with your neighbors and your complex about Jesus. You know, matter of fact, that little saying you have on your door outside, Jesus loves you, take it down. People are going to think you're one of those crazy people, and they're not going to like you anymore. Doesn't that sound reasonable? 
No, to the true hearted believer, yeah. But when you're timid inside and you're afraid and you're worried, what are people going to think? At first time, you put that, that little saying on your desk in your office. What are you, one of those Jesus freaks? Dun, dun, dun. That's how the enemy works. Guys, hear me. His plans are, have never changed. He, he, he is so subtle in how he comes in. And Jesus was saying to the church of Sardis, wake up, return back. If you have an ear, hear me. We have to remove the veil and expose the enemy and his lies of how he's working today against the church. And he's working with our egos and our minds and our hearts, our fears and our worries. He doesn't want us to expose him to other people. He doesn't want us to be a, a person that ex brings their lamp onto the top of a mountain so everyone can see. So the question still remains, how fervent are we out there bringing forth the gospel? Are we as fervent and as bold as Sister Rita? Now, some of you don't know her, but I, I'm sure you have seen the video the last time she was here. She was so proudly displaying the video as she is sharing with a mask on and with a bullhorn in her, in her hands and she is out there by some bus depot with other Christians. They're holding up sign, and there's Pastor Ralph holding up a sign like this. And he always has an answer. Get ready. It'll come sweet and gentle. But there's Sister Rita with the bullhorn singing gospel songs in Spanish. It's awesome, too. Right? It is. Joe, I have to win a soul. The enemy's saying, hey, listen, you got Jesus now. You're going to heaven. Some of us think, you know what? I got Jesus and I'm going to heaven. But these people over here that were so nasty and so vile to me, <laughs> I'm not sharing it with them. They're going to get what's coming to them. That's a not a heart of a true believer. As Jesus walked to Jerusalem... He wept. He wept over them. And they were the same ones that he said on the cross, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. <clears throat> and the truth is what's going to set them and us free. And the truth is that Satan has become subtle. He's become just as effective, if not more effective today than those who were martyred back in the day. We see now today in the churches, and we talk about the great attack in the churches, we see a church very complacent. We see them very fat, rich, socially oriented, and accepted. We see from the pulpits a watered-down theology to accommodate the world. It's a lot more effective than a Christian being boiled in oil, huh? See how Satan works? Now, Jesus, in John chapter 15, warned the church in the statement to his disciples this. It says this in John 15, 18. If the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. We see how he's working, right? That's why we see John saying, love not the world. What happens when a Christian falls in love with the system? The system no longer really is hindered by this guy. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But you're not of the world. But God has chosen you out of the world. Therefore, the world hates you. The truth. The matter is, man, does the world hate us? You know, I wonder that. Maybe they hate me and they just don't say it to my face. I don't know. I share the gospel pretty much everywhere I have an opportunity. I have a guy, man, I love him. I've been inviting him to the church, and he says, 
He says, he, he, he says, Joe, every time I see you, man, you have, you make me feel so good. Is that a song? But anyway. It is, right? Worldly song, huh? No, anyway. And you know what I make them feel good with? The Word of God. I encourage him with the Word. I encourage him with how much God loves him. And it doesn't matter what these people do. It doesn't matter what these people say. What matters is how much God loves you. And then you know what's funny? Because of God's genuine love in me, I can generally love him. But I'm still trying to understand, you know, maybe this is a poor statement, you know, but I, I'm not feeling like I'm really being hated by the world. Maybe that'll come someday. I don't know. But the church needs to remove the veil and stand firm in its faith. And I, I want to be very clear. I don't want us to stand on a soapbox to come against an idea or a lifestyle or a political party. What I want us to do is stand firm in the faith that the world needs Jesus for the remission of their sins. I don't want us to get mixed up with persecution and suffering, but I want us to stand firm in the faith. Before I get into chapter 3, uh, chapter 4, I want to stop here in chapter 3 and I just bring you through it real quick. So then one day, Peter and John, who were going up to the temple at the time of prayer, and that was 3 in the afternoon, they saw a crippled man from birth, and he was being carried off to the temple called Beautiful. Now, this dude, you'll see in the end, he was about 40 years old, so he's been stuck there for quite a long time. And he, believe it or not, in that day was probably towards the tail end of his life. Most, on the average, were living into their mid to late 40s, some even longer, but that was a rarity. For the Christian of that day, it was a lot rarer. And so Peter and John were just about to enter right in, and this guy's asking them for money. And Peter and John, I love this, and I've seen people preach this, look directly at him. And then Peter said, look at us. Sound familiar? Look at me. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I have I give to you. And I want you to understand the first thing that Peter was saying to them, I am not here to meet your physical needs. Because we think that's Christianity 101. It's not. We meet that need to bring forth the gospel. Why did the miracles come? Every time the miracles come, it was to solidify the message of the gospel. That was it. And we think we're giving the gospel out when we buy them a cup of coffee, give them a few coins, buy them some bread. No, that is the way we step in to the conversation. Thank you so much. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you so much. You see it every time. They know more about God than we do. And why are you saying, God bless me? Well, what you just did. I said, brother, that's just a part of it. I said, man, I bought you this meal because I, I know there's more for your life than you sitting on the streets. I said, God wants more for your life than this. He loves you so much and he cares to the point that he died on the cross. And he has great plans for you. Jeremiah 29, 11 says that. Can
can you see what happens here? Because what happens to Peter and John next is that they say, man, silver and gold, I'm not here to meet your physical needs. But what I have, what I have, I give you freely. And each one of us has the voice to give the gospel freely to our neighbor, our friends, our sons, and our daughters. And we need to be bold enough. We need to be strong enough. We need to tear down the veil of criticism. We need to tear the veil of worry and of fear and of doubt. And we need to take a step of faith because Jesus took a step of faith for us. And we need to bring forth the gospel to a dying world. Well, I don't have the tools. Well, you ask these fishermen, you ask the zealot, you ask the tax collector if they had the tools. No, but a true believer, when the Holy Spirit comes upon them and we open up the world, the Word of God, it becomes alive. And then you just sit there and you say, all right, Holy Spirit, work through me. And he does. It's a great journey. You know what it is? It's on-the-job training. On the job training. And it's great being thrown into the fire. I was in Lowe's the other day. I'm really more of a guy who likes Home Depot, but every once in a while I have to go to Lowe's. And I was returning stain at the Lowe's that Lou used to work at. He had juice there at one time. But anyway, so here's the deal. I go in and I say to this girl, I said, listen, you see this stain? My wife hates it. So take it back before she hates me. <laughs> That's not true. I was the one that didn't like the stain, to be honest with you. But anyway. So I said, but listen, I need one of those charts with all the stain colors so we can choose another color. And she looked at me like a deer in headlights. And she looks at me. <laughs> and she says... This is my first day in this department. <laughs> and I said, well, somebody must feel that you, they had enough confidence in you that you're going to make this work. <laughs> so where's my stain chart? God has enough confidence in you that he's going to make it work. This woman just looked at me. She smiled. And you know what? She went and got the answer. She came back and says, we don't have any more. And you know what I said to her? Are you sure? <laughs> you sure there's not another place to check? She goes, I'll be right back. <laughs> there, there's nothing different than us. When we go out there, man, I just share the good news. If you don't have to have all the answers. You can always search for them. You can always get back. You know what? I don't have the answer. But if you give me your phone number, I'll call you back with it. We don't go that way. I, I want you to understand, we have to come and, and become bold people. And we're not here to have to meet everyone's needs. But when we have the opportunity to do such, because what ended up happening, they, they said, we're not here to meet your needs, but what I'm here to give you, I give freely. And he gave forth the gospel, but he healed the man. But listen, he healed him. That was the first step. He met his need. And then he shared Jesus, not just with him, because then what happened is the whole place went crazy because they ended up in the temple at prayer time at three in the afternoon, and they said, hello, that's the beggar. Well, we don't see those miracles happen today. When was the last time you looked in the mirror? When was the last time you shared the testimony how God had saved you, this wretched sinner, from a life that was just, just disgusting and filthy? Because without Christ, every one of us has that kind of testimony. You don't need to be in the witness protection program for that. Hear me now. So these guys, they walked in. The whole temple went crazy. They see this guy. 
And you know what was really cool? They then didn't take any glory from it. They literally deflected from that. But what that did is got everybody's attention. That's all it did. Now listen, I don't want you to go to a bridge later on or sit at the falls ready to jump in to get everybody's attention. Well, now I'm here to share the gospel with you. No, don't do that. No, they had everybody's attention, and then they gave them the good news, but they gave it straight. This Jesus, he's the one who did this. You remember the Jesus when you were given the opportunity to release him or a murderer? You chose the murderer? This same Jesus that you put on the cross... He died for you. He was the Messiah. He was the one that Isaiah 53 talked about. He was the one that loved you enough that he's here today. If you repent, we'll forgive you of all that you have done and will do in the future. See, Danny, we don't want that message getting out. But when it does, persecution follows. So after this dude is healed, Peter speaks to the onlookers. And they were all astonished. Then all of a sudden, a great crowd came. And he says, we are witnesses of this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong in the name of Jesus. And then listen to this. And the faith that comes, and I'm in verse 16. Of John chapter 3, of Acts chapter 3. And it's in the name and the faith that comes through him that has given this complete healing to him as you can all see. Now, brothers, in verse 17, I know that you you're acted in ignorance as did your leaders. I love this man. He, he wasn't holding any punches, right? <laughs> Listen. He was calling them knuckleheads. You were acted in ignorance. In other words, you didn't know any better, as did your leaders. But this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that this Christ would suffer. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord, and that he may, he, he may send the Christ who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. And he must remain in heaven until the time comes. And he just goes on, God, to restore. But he's like, listen, he says, in knowing this, a time of refreshing comes. How did I start this off, brother? Good. Refreshing comes. See, the joy that you and I have that brings us joy is the fact that we are born again believers and one day are going to be with him in glory in heaven. See, it's not about this life. What God has done, he has done same from the beginning. He hasn't changed his message. Just as the Father has sent me, I am sending you out into this world. But he says, take heart. Take comfort in this. I've overcome the world. So brother and sister, you don't need to worry. You don't need to worry about sharing Jesus in the school, in your colleges, at your job, in the supermarket. I was shopping the other day. Can you see me as a quiet person online? I'm not quiet online, right, Shell? You know that. I'm not quiet at all. <laughs> She's going to prepare a snack for us. <laughs> but I'm not quiet. I might be a big mouth person. <laughs> Front row, please be quiet. Sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes you're quiet. Sometimes. I am. I, I, <laughs> but I look for the opportunity. 
I'm going to tell you why. Because I understand the great price that had been paid for me. And for the remission of my sins. See, when most people don't get that into here, they don't understand. Jesus never looked back at the cross again. He says to his disciples, it is finished. He says, just as the Father said, I need you to be my messengers. And you know what was amazing about Peter? He did a better job than Jesus when it came to followers. Man, he shared the gospel once and 3,000 got saved. 3,000 men. And he shares it again and 5,000 men get saved. I saw only a few standing at the cross when Jesus died. See, Jesus understood what he needed to do. His first coming was to pay for sins and to set the record straight. But it was for us to share the gospel of what he did. It's kind of like he was trying to tell them, listen, this is why I've come. I am the Messiah. I'm here to die for the remission of your sins. I love you that much. But it's going to be your job to go out and tell everybody else. And that's what the early church did. And they were persecuted for it. They were boiled. They were hung. They were crucified. No, that's not how Satan works today. Not here in America anyway. But in other countries, man, people counted a joy when they're persecuted. <clears throat> this is what Peter has to say. It's an important statement. 1 Peter 2, 21. For, unto, for hereunto where you are called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps. If you confront the world, the world will react violently one way or another. Just as Christ suffered, we're here to suffer. Persecution. And that persecution comes by standing on the trueness of the gospel of Jesus Christ and boldly confronting sin. You know, I kind of find it sad, and I'm going to get ready to wrap this up. You got a testimony for me, brother? You're going to end it for us, but let me wrap it up with this. I, we see a lot of churches that have rainbow flags nowadays, right? I don't want to confuse that church with this church. I have no problem for any person of any lifestyle, of any gender, attending our church. I want to be very clear, and you shouldn't have a problem either inviting people who may be confused, lost, living in sin. I don't need to have a rainbow flag out there to say that. But I don't hang that flag to condone the sin and say it's acceptable by God. I want to be very clear. I, man, I don't... Listen, I remember the first time I walked into a church... When I left, the building was still standing, and I was amazed. You get my drift? So I don't want any of us to be hindered or think that we can't share with anybody. And I, I didn't even scratch the surface. This is more of an opening statement about exposing the enemy, and we need to do that. You need to feel free. I don't care who you are or what you are. Well, you're, you, you're a church. You're going to persecute me. No, no, no. Come on in. We're going to watch the Holy Spirit change. It's his power that brought healing. Can I tell you something? That's what you have to remember. It was his power that brought healing. And when people say, I have the gift of healing, can I tell you something? No, you don't. 
I said it's the power of God working through this vessel. He has the gift of healing. He just chose to use us. My brother's got a testimony. Come on up front here. Look at this guy. He's sharp. Thanks for inviting me. I'm going to grab you a mic, otherwise I might get rebuked. You should have seen the sound room. He's like that haircut, huh? Now, I'm not sure if this is on, but we're going to find out in a minute. It's on. All right, share, share with us what the Lord has done. He just covered that scripture yesterday. Man with the, who's lost all his hair is clean. There we go. Good morning, church. Good morning. I'm here because I felt the need to give praise and thanks to the Lord. Amen. In the presence of others. I spent a year or so getting very close to a family, and then they moved to Texas. And when they did, they found out that the child had brain cancer, and she suffered. And for the last three weeks, she was stricken with heart attacks and sepsis and things like that. But a couple days ago, she came out of that after removing her from her feeding tubes and everything else, which is usually an indicator that it's time to go. And she came out of her coma, cancer-free. And it's awake, obviously, out of your coma, awake. But that is... I'm, that's got to be God because she was very close to being gone and called home. But the reason I need to thank the Lord for that is because during those weeks of her troubles, I was feeling a certain way about how God can perform miracles, but that he often doesn't. And I was angry about that because I feel like we don't need that lesson with our children. So I've never been happier to be wrong. Hmm. So that's what I wanted to share is that we are very often wrong, even within our faith of what God can accomplish for us. Yes. But he doesn't do it for us. <laughs> I wasn't testing God. I wasn't fully angry at God. I just didn't have any faith that he would do that. Because I tell the story all the time. My mother would say, oh, thank God I remembered to turn off the stove. Thank God reminded me to turn off the stove. I'm like, well, God reminded you to turn off the stove, but he didn't cure that kid with cancer? And that's where my doubt began and just kept rolling. Because if, if I don't think that God can do the big things, why would I consider that God is doing the small things? That's right. So this definitely strengthened my faith. And I think that for God, the lesson here is, no, I'm not teaching God a lesson, but, <laughs> you know, I, I think the lesson is that everything matters, which is opposite of some of the things that we learn where nothing matters, but it does matter. Yes. So that brings me closer. So God wasn't teaching me a lesson through this child's cancer. He was teaching me a lesson through my own doubt. Yes. So, be, and, and I think that lesson came because I wasn't testing God. I wasn't saying, God, if you're real, make this happen. I didn't say that. I just said, I don't think you will. And God was like, here, hold my wine. <laughs> and I'm sure there were so many other things that happened that I didn't take into account or give God the glory for. So that's yeah. why I'm here to, right now. So thank you, Lord, for curing our Bella. And that cure came from everywhere, from the people you created that made the medicines and cared for her and prayed for her in the prayer chain that was created on Facebook. And I just thank you, Lord, for all of that. Amen, amen. Thank you so much, Mr. I like what my brother said, that 
we have to remember that God's in the little things. And we don't sometimes see that in, until we get to a point of suffering. My wife was sharing with me the other day a story when they were in Austria or Hungary at the time, I think it was Hungary, when they were escaping communism, that this woman, when they were going shopping, just for whatever they can get, this woman would save pennies, you know? And she found two empty cans, and she rejoiced over the fact for these cans. And they got her like a nickel, or whatever it was. I mean, we, we sometimes forget that God is in everything, no matter how small or no matter how big the miracle is. It's still God. Father, we just come to you this morning, Lord, and we surrender our hearts and minds to you, recognizing that you are sovereign over all things. And God, we're so grateful, Lord, but Lord, we're also grateful for the fact that you're trying to wake up your church. You're trying to wake up the body. And Father, we know that within the body there are tares and wheat. And they grow together. But when persecution comes, Father, the real believer, the fruitful believer will remain standing and the tares will run. They will be choked out by the power of the Holy Spirit. So, Father, we're praying for a real church, a true biblical church. So, Father, remove the veil from our eyes and our hearts and our minds. And, Father, we ask that the church would grow with true believers. Believers who have a heart after you, have a heart after the message of the hope that we have in Jesus that have a heart and a desire to share the good news with a world that is lost because the enemy is trying to keep us down. So, Father, I pray for boldness. I pray for strength for the body of Christ that is gathered here. I pray, Father, as I repent and maybe others, Father, for the lack of sharing the good news. Father, create in us more boldness to invite people into church to hear the good news. It doesn't matter what lifestyle they're living or maybe or how they're living. But, Father, we just pray that, Father, we would have the boldness to share the good news of the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Now, strengthen this body of believers. Strengthen us, Father, through the breaking of bread. Strengthen us, Father, through the giving of tithes. These are both holy sacraments. And I pray for every cheerful giver here today, Lord. I thank you for them, and I pray that, Father, that you would bless them for giving. Father, bless them, Father, for sharing their first fruits, just as you shared your first fruit in your son Jesus with us. Now bless the offerings and the tithes that have been given. Thank you, Father. Thank you that we're able to give. Now as a church, may we be wise stewards of that which has been entrusted to us. And Father, even now, as we get ready to send out another 3,000 to the field, the mission field, I pray that you would use it in the advancement of your kingdom. I pray this in Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen, amen and Amen. God bless you. Thank you.